Okay, uh, thank you for, uh, uh, we're going to uh, keep uh, the, the uh, um, session moving forward here. It's my great pleasure to uh, introduce Diana Mitzva, uh, who is on the faculty here in the, um, uh, at uh, the Department of, uh, or School of Urban and Regional Planning, excuse me, School of Urban and Regional Planning at uh, uh, Florida Atlantic University. Uh, she has experience in geographic information systems, uh, GPS data collection and image processing, uh, and she's also worked uh, internationally uh, on projects funded by the World Bank and the European Commission in her native Bulgaria. Uh, I'm particularly interested in this session because she's talking about sea level rise, and like uh, Professor Lang, uh, it's happening whether or not we believe in it. Uh, so I think we need to start getting ahead of the pro uh, problem now and thinking about it. And she's going to be speaking about uh, rising water potential impacts on developed South Florida. Uh, she's going to go about 25 minutes or so, and then we'll have uh, a bit of time for question and answer. So, Diana, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, do you hear me okay? Okay. Just excuse me. Um, most of us, uh, in, in, including me, we think of sea level rise as something that uh, we'll probably start seeing uh, the physical or the visible signs in probably 20, 30 years. So we live with uh, this uh, comfortably with this feeling that we have uh, something like about 20, 30 years to think about sea level rise, plan for it, figure it out, and decide what to do. What I'm going to do uh, first here in this presentation, I'm going to show you some pictures. And these uh, pictures, they come from sea level rise workshop that was held in Australia um, a few months ago. Uh, and um, I'll talk about this picture uh, and something that is probably happening. We haven't captured this here yet, but uh, look at that. So tidal penetration through stormwater system in Burley Street, Botany Bay, which is south of Sydney. Tidal, it's a spring, a spring tide event, uh, December 13 to 15, 2008. Um, then we have tidal penetration through Carrington, Newcastle. Carrington is a small uh, peninsula, and we have the ocean on the east side, and then we have a bay on the west side. So this area is pretty vulnerable, so I understand that it, things like that might happen in the springtime. Uh, and look at that. When I, when I first saw this picture, I thought it's all in the same area, the same neighborhood, and I thought it's probably the, whip, the equivalent of what we have here in Hollandale when it's, uh, we have the springtime and high water. And you know, Hollandale is under three feet of water every time it rains, so it didn't impress me very much. But then last night, I decided to look, uh, look this, uh, where these places are on Google Earth. And to my surprise, actually, these places are very far apart. They are tens and even hundreds of miles apart. Some of these places are on the, the coastline. Some are at the harbor. But some of these places are inland. And this place, Oakley, is actually maybe 20, 30 miles inland from the coastline. It has the, we have the ocean, then we have the Botany Bay, and it's way, way, way west and far inland from Botany Bay. Uh, it's, it has con hydraulic connectivity to the bay and to the ocean, but just think of it, that's a tidal event. It's not a weather event, it's not a storm, it's a tidal event. And you see this tidal inundation that is so far inland. So we have another one, again, Otley, the same tidal event. And then this is December 2008. And I have picture from January 2009, uh, Southern End, Manly Beach. January, it's uh, close to Sydney. It's January 12, 2009. And then I have this Currabilly Point, Sydney Harbor, January 12. Currabilly Point is a suburb of Sydney. It's like two, three miles north of uh, the central business district. And this is where the Governor General and the Prime Minister of Australia have their residences. <laughs> and you see the water and this woman that is, what the hell is going on here? OK, so what is really uh, going on? So we know from the IPCC third assessment report, you know, and it's pretty much supported by the fourth assessment report that uh, in geologically stable environments, and it's very important, sea level rise, the, the, the rate is approximately 20 centimeters per century or 3 millimeters per year. So I was reading, this, there is a report of NOAA that just came out in, um, uh, last week, and I was reading through this report on Friday when I was doing this uh, preparation for this presentation. 
And look what it says on page 17. The present trend in global sea level rise is 3 millimeters per year for the global oceans, which is 12 inches over 100 years, which is way faster. And they have this, uh, the data, the uh, altimetry data from topics, JSON 1, JSON 2. And as you can see, the, the trend is toward uh, acceleration. And it's uh, 3 plus minus 0.4 millimeters per year. And this is the, from the NOAA report that just came out, technical considerations for use in geospatial data and sea level change mapping and assessment. OK, so just for those of you who don't uh, sleep with the sea level rise manual under the pillow like I do, that three contributing factors uh, to sea level rise one and probably the, for, the most important one for now is the heat distribution within the ocean, which uh, contributes to the thermal expansion or the steric sea level rise. And there are a lot of unknowns here because we still don't know what's the interaction between the sea surface temperature and the interior of the ocean. And there is some studies that says actually the more heat the interior takes, it actually cools down the, the, the climate because it takes, but it accelerates sea level rise because of the thermal expansion of the ocean. The, the another uh, contributing factor is volumetric change, which is uh, the change in the sheer mass of water within the oceans. And it's mainly due to the melting ice in glaciers, ice caps, and ice sheets. Uh, there are some outrageous projections uh, here related to especially the, the green white ice sheet, which says that it's going to contribute up to seven meters of sea level rise. What I have here is actually the working projections for the Dutch government. Those are the projections that I use. So as you can see, they're much lower than that. They give a total of all the, the ice melting, a total of up to 3.5 meter, which is approximately 140 inches. Those are the, the working projections, as I said, for the Dutch government. And they invest, they already do that, 1 billion euros, it's not dollars, euros per year to plan and prepare for sea level rise. And finally, which is probably, I think, probably one of the most important factors, we have the, the vertical land movement or the isostatic uh, sea level rise, which is related to the local uh, and regional variations in sea level rise. And these regional trends can account for as much as 7 to over 10 millimeters per year or the last minus 10 millimeters per year. And then, Again, this comes from the, the NOAA, the, this uh, latest report. I have this map here, which actually, which shows this regional variation. The most vulnerable area to sea level rise is the Gulf Coast, like the Gulf Coast line. As you see, we have here up to 10 millimeters per year uh, rate of sea level rise, and it's mainly due to the settling of young sediments in the Mississippi Delta, and also some other factors as uh, oil extraction activities. There are very high rates here at the Galveston and the Shania Plain in Texas. We also have uh, here the, the Carolinas, and it's all have those regional variations um, because it's uh, differing largely from part to part. Mainly here is ma mainly due to the Carolinas glacial rebound. I have in Florida, Luckily, we have relatively stable geology, and the rates is not that high, but it's still uh, quite uh, significant. So what do we do? And I look at all this research, and there is something that I would call guesstimated impacts, because those are estimates, but they also kind of guessed. Uh, there is some, um, so we know that it's going to contribute to um, beach erosion. Uh, but the problematic thing is that those studies have really been done on a local basis. How and to what extent depends largely on local conditions. You cannot just say, oh, sea level rise, 0.3 inches of sea level rise, 3 feet be beach erosion, and you start calculation. Those are guesstimates, are what I would call. It's not real science. Then we have another one that says that as a result of 3 uh, feet sea level rise, a uh, 10-year storm uh, flood will actually uh, cover the area of what is now a 100-year storm. Again, how, to what extent, depends on local conditions. With one foot of sea level rise, flood damage will increase 30 to 60 percent, and with three feet, 100, 100 to 200 percent. What are we talking about? So it's all in this literature. And then more of this impact on utilities and free, uh, infrastructure, certainly there will be such impacts. But again, how, to what extent? depends on, 
on local conditions. Okay, so where do we go from here? So, and this is, and then I, when I started doing this maybe like two years ago, the first and the most important thing that we need is data, and we need to, and also we need to realize that this data come with certain issues. Sea level rise assessment have been used doing all this, uh, using all these elevation data sets. So it's from five foot wide elevator to uh, top of 30 or one kilometer by one kilometer set, uh, global raster. Um, LIDAR light detection and raging um, is relatively recent remote sensing technology is uh, based on infrared laser pulses that go back and forth while flight uh, and scan the ground. So this is the most precise uh, elevation that, uh, data that we have. It's a great improvement on previous technology as in terms of vertical accuracy, but it also has its issues. And the issues are the artifacts. And it's very expensive to actually uh, research and remove all the artifacts from this data. So we need to be aware of that. Vertical accuracy is very important, and this is an example here that shows you why is that. Uh, because the vertical accuracy is actually tells you when you have on the LiDAR something that says one meter elevation, and you know that the vertical accuracy is 0.3 meters, which means that at this particular point, the true elevation is somewhere between 0.7 and 1.3 meters. That's the true elevation. And you, you have a 30 meter LiDAR which has a vertical accuracy of 2.2 meter. When you map one meter and try to, to see, uh, like for example, one meter of sea level rise, it's actually the true elevation at this point is somewhere between 3.2 and below sea level. So that's the true elevation. So you cannot, we cannot use these data sets. The only data set that is not without issues, but the only one that we should rely upon doing this assessment is the, the, the LIDAR data that is covered. And then vertical accuracy is also important when you define the minimum increment of sea level rise. So it should be at least twice the linear error in your data set. So you cannot go and have something, oh, I'll map um, like half a foot, I'll map below half a foot. No, you cannot do that. There is some standards that you need to follow. And it's for this data that I have, the minimum increment that I can map is 1.5 foot, so that you know I'm, I have some backup for, uh, about you know how uncertain this data is. How do we do another problem? Problematic thing is how do we do? What's the methodology? And the most common approach, and I did my fair share, of that is the bathtub approach, and you map one, two, three, four, five foot of sea level rise. Oh, I didn't call this that. Why I call it? elevation below one foot elevation. So I, although it appears here colored in blue, it doesn't mean it's inundation. It means elevation below one foot, elevation below two feet, elevation below three feet. Uh, so uh, you see here is, for those of you who you know don't work with maps that often, here is uh, the Fall Lauderdale area. And then when we started doing this, and Dr. Voss looked at it and said, look how this natural hydrology starts to appear on the map. So you see all these uh, Renew River and things like that, you know, that are now all, everything is now covered by urban area and have the canals, but the natural uh, hydrology still appears on this map. And then we have um, elevations below two feet, elevations below three feet, and elevations below five feet. And you see most of Broward County, and I see, also you see far west, this is the extent of the lighter. So I didn't have this first lighter that was done in 2001, didn't go all the west uh, to, the, to the Everglades. So that's, we have two lighter data sets now available. One is the 2001 lighter from the Florida International University, and then we have the FDEM lighter, 10 foot lighter that covers the entire 2008 covers the entire urban area and just for, this is just for Brown County. Uh, but as I said, as I'm going along with this, I found this type of mapping to have a lot of issues. So I did also some assessment of land use maps um, with this, but as I said, I'm not going over this because I found this uh, to be a pro kind of problematic. The next thing I did is actually consider the linear area within the LIDAR and I map the uncertainty. So what is the, the percentage that this, so the area above 
uh, 1.5 feet, including linear, linear error. So I map this uncertain area too. <coughs> 